welcome to Undercurrent, where we look at what's been happening in and around Perth. I'm Lucy Marchant, and I'm your host. On this episode of Undercurrent, we look closely at the federal elections of 2016, ask the public what they think about their pensions, and we meet with a scientist who thinks that tidal power can be the new renewable energy of Australia. But first, this week, the Ethnic Communities Council of Western Australia held a public forum for their members to better understand what the elections meant to them. I went to check it out. Tonight, the Ethnic Communities Council of Western Australia is holding a pre-election public forum where representatives from the Labour Party and the Greens Party will welcome questions about multiculturalism and the representation of ethnic minorities in Australia. What is the importance of events like tonight's event? Look, the events of tonight, there are very, very few big bodies. I use the words, you can count them on half a hand, that are actually organising forums such as this. It is not our business to tell you know, our constituents or the members of, of those constituent bodies as to which party that they should vote for. But we believe it's our job to ensure that we make available as much information as possible so that they can make informed choices come 2nd of July. It demonstrates, I guess, uh, to uh, policy makers that, look, here's a group that brings together people who are impacted by every one of their policies and also have an input into how those impacts can be measured and how they can be dealt with. The perspective of the people who attended, it was fantastic to be able to voice their views and also get some uh, questions put on notice. From the candidates' point of view, they then picked up what were the hot issues and the real hot-button issues were raised today. And uh, from the organization's point of view, the Ethnic Communities Council, it's really about us uh, profiling ourselves as saying, look, here's a group of people who have some issues that we need to talk about federally, state level, whatever it may be. What made you want to come to this public forum tonight? Well, these sort of discussions raise important issues to the Cal community and I think it's really important for politicians or aspiring politicians to actually come and engage with communities and know what they think and what they need before um, embarking on any election. And I think that that relationship should continue after the election as well. Some of the key issues facing the multicultural society is acceptance and integration. Some of us have been here like 15 years and sometimes we still don't feel part of the community. Um, however, Australians themselves are really welcoming and we are grateful that we have a home here. However, some of the things we see in the media and what some of the things that politicians say still make us feel like foreigners in our new home and this is truly our home. Some of us do not have an option of returning to where we came from. There's so much inequality, there's so many vulnerable group groups in Australia that in fact often lack a voice in Parliament that I see it as part of my job to make sure that we're reflecting their voice and what they tell us in the Parliament. What are some of the key issues facing multicultural society in Australia today? There's clearly issues around access to services. So tonight we've been hearing about, and I you know, was talking about it too, the issues around access to disability services, ac access to aged care services, language services. But then there's the broader issue at the moment, the way the debate in Australia is going. It certainly does undermine how our multicultural society. So we also need to be changing the debate so we are more supportive of all the diversity in our community, but also asylum seekers and refugees are still really important issues that we need to change and we need to stop demonising people that are seeking asylum and treating them with compassion and respect. The issues that are facing newly arrived migrants, multicultural communities, ethnic communities today are very much the same that they were back then. And that is primarily equality, equality of outcomes, um, equality of opportunity, access to opportunities, discrimination continues to be a huge issue, um, you know, language services, access to language services continues to be a huge issue. Um, but really it all comes down to a fair and just society. 
putting funding back into the services that this government cut in its budgets over the last couple of years is also really important. Supporting a more uh, a work, a aged care workforce, for example, that actually does address the issues of the cold community. Same with disabilities. So we're taking a broad range of policies to uh, this election. Protecting Australia's healthcare system, protecting Medicare, ensuring that it's not privatised, ensuring that all Australians have access to quality healthcare benefits those communities as well. Education, implementing the Gonski recommendations, ensuring that schools are well funded, that, uh, that uh, uh, schools, particularly schools with high migrant populations, and some of them tend to also be low socioeconomic demographics as well, ensuring that those schools are well funded benefits our cowled communities. Labor has always been a party about equality, a party of the fair go. And it's, though, it's that very value system, that very um, uh, basis of what Labor is, that ensures that all our, po all our policies do not disadvantage cowled communities and benefit cowled communities. Lucy Marchant, reporting for Undercurrent. Welcome back to Undercurrent. Last week, a group of volunteers gathered in the city with buckets of water to raise awareness and call for an increase. In March this year, it was announced that retiring federal politicians will be paid at least $118,000 in tax-free pensions after they leave Parliament, or $4,500 per fortnight, whereas the daily Australian pensioner is paid $867 per fortnight. Today I'm here in the streets of Perth to ask people their opinions on this. Yeah, I don't think it's unreasonable for a politician to have a six-figure sum when he retires or she retires. I think they should be able to get sufficient from their pension to maintain their lifestyle. Name of Jesus Christ, that's wrong. Once they finish the job, that's it. Either do the work if you're still young or get a pension. And that's it. Be like the others. Too much. Way too much. For, uh, I don't think it's uh, acceptable. It's uh, ridiculous. Do you think the pensions towards retiring politicians should be scrapped and made equal with everyday Australian pensioners' entitlements? Yep, I do. Because they're doing a job just like we did a job. And they chose to go into Parliament and we chose to go in different sectors. So, yeah, it should be the same. Certainly not. I don't agree with that at all. The politician's getting a superannuation, which is totally different to the pension. So the comparison is not really true. But if it's a pension, I think all pensioners should get the same. The payment during their time as politicians should be enough to, uh, uh, to keep them in retirement like everyone else. They shouldn't be getting anything over and above what everyone else gets. Either pay everyone more, which we probably can't afford, or bring down the um, pension for politicians to the normal rate like everyone else. What do you think of the current pension age, which ranges from 65 to 67 years old? Should it remain as it is, be brought forward or backwards? I think it should remain the same. If people are asked to work longer, um, some people are not able to do that because a lot of work is physically demanding. I think it should remain. I think these, you know, people have uh, gotten to a certain age where they should be able to enjoy the, um, the latter part of their, their lifetimes. I think it should remain where it is until it can be proved that uh, there's a reason to change it. I think 67 is a good age. That was when I retired. If anything, it should remain as it is or go younger. Otherwise, you're stretching up towards grandparents, great-grandparents. It's just too long to be working. I understand why it's gone up, but I think it should remain at 65. An extra couple of years to work makes it very difficult for some people. Yeah, 65. With the elections coming up next Saturday, which political party do you think has the best plans for pensioners? I think neither have the best plans for pensioners, actually, because, uh, as I said, they have allegiance only to them themselves because they're a private corporation and they don't represent the people. I think the Liberals. Neither one of them. Neither of them, because too many of them lie before they get their job, before they are voted for. After they are voted, they don't do that what they plan. I'm happy as it is, and whatever party is willing to keep it the same, um, they're the ones I think that um, would be best for pensioners. I think they probably have equally good ideas about it, but. Uh, I don't think either party has really come out and nailed it just yet. Michael Sir reporting for Undercurrent.
Australian aid. Michael went along to check it out. Matagarup, known as Harrison Island, has been a sacred place and a home to the Noongar people for centuries. Today, a community... I have here with me Mr. Pedro Schent, who is running for WA Senate. Mr. Pedro Schent is representing the Renewable Energy Party and the party is running for the first time this election. The main aim of the party is to basically get 100% renewable power generation by 2030. Okay, so that's our power sector. And by 2040, to have all our energy sourced from renewable sources. That's easy with current technology that we have right now. We just need the political will to do it. The idea of the Renewable Energy Party really is to get climate change issues and the renewable energy transition issues front and centre in the political debate. Also, we're looking at um, a just transition um, to a carbon-free economy. Obviously, we've got loads of people working in the uh, fossil fuel sector. Uh, I'm not exactly sure on how we're going to do this, but there'll be consultation with those communities in finding good employment uh, for them using the skills that they do have. Do you foresee any challenges in achieving your aims? The biggest challenge is that we're a very new party. We don't, uh, not a lot of people know about us. Um, most people find out about the Renewable Energy Party, frankly, when on election day when they see our name there. Uh, I guess the good thing we are a single issue party. The two main parties are working very hard to exclude independents and minor parties. I, my gut feeling is that people are over it. Um, they want different voices. There's certain people that have always say voted Liberal and they will never vote Labor. But at, at the same token, they really disagree with the Liberal Party stance on renewable energy. Um, so yes, they might vote for, say, the Liberals in, um, uh, in the lower house and mm -hmm. their electorate but then they might give a party like the renewable energy party their first preference in in the senate and that to me sends a really strong message to the major parties that they actually have to take climate change and renewable energy seriously how would you describe the current attitude of the major parties towards climate change the lnp i mean it's the main reason i'm standing i'm just frustrated it it's terrible terrible policy. The general view is that the small parties come enter the political scene this election and they fade away by next election. Do you think the Renewable Energy Party can keep going? Uh, look, I think they can. Uh, the transition to a renewable energy future is, you know, it, it's a 10 to 20 year project if we get behind it and we're serious. Uh, if the major parties drag their heels, well, there's more of a reason to do it. You, for example, when everyone makes the link of climate change and burning fossil fuels, the demand for action will be quite astounding. That's that's my firm belief. Uh, I would love to see there not a re, not a need for the renewable energy party. If if both major parties actually got on the same page and actually listened. Uh, to rational scientific evidence and what the world needs to do. I, I think renewable energy is on most people's lips. Uh, most people feel really good about it. Um, my, you know, something like 90% of people, if you were to ask, would say they all agree solar is great. Um, with wind turbines, it's about 80%. All other forms of energy, it, it goes down the scale. So there's really positive feelings about the renewable energy renewable energy in this country and that might translate to the Renewable Energy Party. Personally, I'm quietly optimistic but I really have no idea. It, it's a double dissolution election, it's, it's something I haven't been a part of or seen in my lifetime in this country. There's a lot of minor parties uh, out there that uh, perhaps don't resonate as well uh, because they don't have, I guess, broad agreement. So we're definitely in with a chance. It's our first time. We never know how, how we're going to go, but I would like to get in. I'd like to have my say in Parliament and uh, bring renewable energy and climate change issues right into the centre of public debate. Because the thing is, this is the biggest 
disaster that we are heading towards. This is Thichin Longmo reporting for Undercurrent. Each week for the last five years, a number of passionate poets have gathered every Saturday to present and share their love of poetry. Angela went to check out one of our sessions. I'm at the Central TAFE building in East Perth where a non-profit organisation, Sustainable Energy Now, is hosting a presentation about tidal wave energy. I'm about to meet with Ivan Quayle, who is going to tell us a little bit about the science behind tidal energy as a sustainable source of energy and its potential to power Australia. I'm also going to meet with Mr John Lewis, who is a pioneer in the subject. Tonight's presentation is all about using tidal power as a renewable energy source. Can you tell us about the science behind that technology? Yes, certainly. Uh, there are two, two forms of tidal power. One is uh, the horizontal flow of water, which is called tidal stream or kinetic energy. And then there's also uh, tidal range energy, which is uh, the difference in height of, uh, between high tide and low tide, which you can capture behind the, the uh, wall of a dam or a barrage as it's known. And then when there's a, a difference in the two levels, you let the water out through turbines and you generate electricity. Uh, we up in the Kimberleys on the, um, in the, on the West Australian coast have, uh, I believe, uh, the, the largest tidal power resource in the Southern Hemisphere. It's huge, it really is huge. It can generate um, you know, five, six times more electricity than we currently generate in the whole of Australia. Nature has made the tides very high for various reasons around there. It starts, say, round about Onslow as a modest tide of about two metres, increases all the way until you get to Broome. We've got rather a big tide there. Then it remains pretty large all the way round to Darwin and tails off. And by the time you get to uh, Cape York, the tides are quite low again. It's to do with convergence on the sea floor and rotation of the earth. Is this technology used? anywhere else in the world? Yes, certainly. Uh, Laurent's tidal power station in France was built in 1966, or opened in 1966, and uh, until very recently, like three, four years ago, it was the largest uh, tidal power station in the world. In 2010, the Shiba Lake tidal power station opened in South Korea, um, and uh, then there's a, a smaller one in Annapolis and another small one in China and I believe a small one in Russia as well. This technology is used in other countries. Why is Australia not adopting tidal energy? Well, because of the tyranny of distance, which only recently we've been able to overcome that without huge transmission losses. Uh, one of the problems has always been, how do you get that electricity from the Kimberleys, which is pretty remote, to Perth, to Sydney, to Melbourne, and uh, over the years, high voltage DC power lines have advanced and now you could uh, transmit power from the Kimberleys to Sydney and only have a, an 8% transmission loss. One of the big things with tidal power stations is that you know you, you, you borrow the capital to build them and of course you have to pay interest uh, for 40 years to pay it off but at the end of 40 years uh, then <clears throat> the only expense is the operating and maintenance costs. That's why Laurent produces the cheapest electricity in the whole of Europe. The snag with tidal power is, as Ivan said, the capital cost. That's what's held it back. But, uh, you know, as things are going now, the capital charges are much less than they used to be. And I think also the federal government in the last budget, they did give some encouragement towards people developing uh, power that was renewable. In what ways can you approach the government to try and adopt this? Ah, I've been I've been harassing the government for years, <laughs> uh, both both governments, Labor and Liberal, uh, to uh, you know investigate it further and do some research and uh, put some sums together uh, to see how good it can be. But uh, I haven't had any uh, positive responses as yet. <laughs> the uh, the cost of the tidal power station is uh, one third of the cost of the nuclear power station. So uh, certainly very competitive and it lasts three times longer. So in the long run, it'll be, cheap, it'll be cheaper than gas and cheaper than coal and cheaper than nuclear. 
And a lot cleaner. And a lot cleaner too. <laughs> Absolutely. Lucy Marchant, reporting for Undercurrent. Another new political party has emerged. Angela finds out how the Arts Party can represent you in the upcoming election. Art and culture within Western Australia is rich and diversified, but it's running the risk of losing its identity. There's a new group in town called the Arts Party with the upcoming election, and they want their voice to be heard, and they want all of us who are interested in the arts to become involved. It was basically a, a party that was started out of Sydney um, by uh, uh, two, two artists, uh, PJ Collins and Nicholas Gledhill back in 2013. Art is something that is essential to, to us as a, as a people, as a country. It really permeates everything we do. You, know, you, you get up in the morning, you put on your clothes that have been designed by, you know, by an artist, by a designer, get into a car that's been designed. So there's music, local music that's there. You know, you've got billboards, you've got galleries, you've got artwork. And a lot of people don't realise the importance and how dependent they are on culture. You know, culture really does make life you know, uh, worth living. At the end of the day, it's transformational for the individual and the society. We just feel that, look, it has to be taken seriously. It has to be taken seriously at a government level, given that they are major agents of change toward the proliferation of culture, particularly in, for example, in WA, which has had uh, massive closures of, of not just music venues, but commercial art galleries, um, arts groups. It becomes very hard to not have that sort of um, additional support or at least additional um, insight from the government. And that can come in in terms of funding. It can come through education, um, you know, a, a, range of, um, a range of avenues that over the last decade have just become harder and harder to assail. So um, as a combined concentrated force, the creative industries um, have never been great at lobbying in this country, you know, certainly not as good as they are overseas in terms of being able to get people's attention and, and you know, and push their points into, uh, into consideration for, you know, in, at a Senate level or, or, or higher. So I think the Arts Party is actually a really important step toward enabling that process and really giving artists and creatives in this country and people who uh, support the arts and feel passionate about the arts, giving them an opportunity to, to be that voice. I think to a large extent um, they're overlooking the importance that art and music programs have on, on a developing mind in school. So two out of five schools now have arts programs and you know it used to be five out of five. A lot of schools can't afford to have dedicated art teachers coming in or dedicated music teachers so it's often combined here and there and it just gets sort of lost in the mix. Widening the support for the arts means that it you know, basically it then becomes something that everyone can engage with, particularly here in WA, in decades to come, you've got those little kids growing up and they're the next generation. And the problem is when the funding and the support is being choked out of these organisations, there's nowhere for these kids to, to go. Um, there's nowhere for students to go and see the best works of art. Bands will stop coming here, the venues won't be here. It's actually the first party in the world to be entirely crowdfunded, so um, it's, which, which is fantastic because it immediately shows that there's a definite interest and support from, from the public toward arts and culture. And um, you know the party is also uh, the only party in the world totally devoted to arts and culture and creativity. So the party leader is PJ Collins. Uh, in WA, we're, uh, we have two candidates standing as myself and also Robert Taylor, whose uh, background is more in performing arts. Uh, my background is more in, in fine art. We, we're actually fortunate we're standing candidates in every state. So the party's actually, you know, it's, it's been growing consistently for the last couple of years. And I, I think, I dare say over the last 12 months, it's probably had its, its largest growth. But that's been also through just some very innovative social media techniques to get, get the message out there. And also just, I think, a, a growing frustration from artists and creatives in this country where they're just feeling they're not getting listened to. And that's, you know, so uh, they will naturally gravitate to the arts party. There's never been a debate in my household about the importance of the arts, but in my country at the moment, the arts is under siege. Art schools, art tastes, 
art education are all slowly being dismantled. The Arts Party has come in response to that and today please consider supporting them. I'm Angela Albuquerque for Undercurrent. WTV Your View app so you can watch us from any of your mobile devices. Take care and we'll see you.